friends, beautiful people listening to this podcast, I am so excited. One of my very favorite people on the entire planet is with me today. Mel Robbins is here. She is one of the leading voices in personal development and transformation. She is an international bestseller. Her work, of course, includes The Five Second Rule and a book that is coming out that is going to literally change your life called The High Five Habit. Take control of your life with one simple habit, which is going to be released around the world on September 28th. She also created the number one podcast on Audible, Start Here, Pep Talks for Life, and three number one audiobooks, Take Control of Your Life, Kick Ass with Mel Robbins, and Work It Out. Mel coaches more than 60 million people online every single month, and her videos feature her doing the thing that she was placed on this planet to do. She's also done a TED Talk. It's one of the most popular of all time. She is one of the greatest human beings I've ever been able to spend time with personally, and I'm excited to introduce you to her on this podcast today. Please rise, remove your hats, and welcome Mel Robbins to the Rise Together podcast. Oh, thank Dave, that was so nice. Honestly, Uh, I love you. I literally love you, and I don't say that to everybody. I mean, I say it to everybody. I just don't mean it every other time. I mean it with you. (laughs) You and I, I think we're related in another life. Really, we, we, we left our time together and my husband turned to me and said, there is no doubt that Dave Hollis and you were brother and sister in another life. He is you in a male form, only funnier. And it is true. You had me laughing, crying, all of it uh, in the time we spent together recently. So I love you too. Uh, I'm so I will, happy. I, got I to will say you. this, like we, we had this opportunity that we brag about on the internet every once in a while of getting together in a mastermind. And people have asked me like, okay, so who of the people that you got to hang out with, this illustrious list of the who's who inside of personal development had the biggest impact on you. And I swear to you, Mel, not because you're sitting here in front of me, I said you every single time. And here's why, why. because you have this ability to own all of yourself in a way that shares as much the success as it does the struggle. And there is in the humanity of your willingness to welcome people to walk alongside you in the imperfectness of your growing journey, something that says, I'm like you. There's like this massive empathy bridge that just exists between you and the people that you are spending time with. And it's beautiful. I just love it so much. Oh, thank you. That's really kind. I I tried to introduce you. I mean, I was given the notes, so I know how to read, but I'm curious if maybe in your own words, you could, for a listener who is not as familiar with you, tell people in your own words who you are, and then secondarily, why you believe you are here. So um, here's how I would have you think about me. I am your uh, friend that used to be really screwed up, that got her act together. (laughs) And and she she took you alongside during the horror show. And now uh, she's on a mission to help you in any way that she can to save you from the headache and the heartaches that she caused herself. Um, Like, I feel like my brand of um, personal development, Dave, is to screw up my own life and then to have to claw my way out of the hole, sometimes that other people have thrown me into, but usually the hole that I've either fallen into because I wasn't paying attention or I grabbed a shovel and dug for myself. So um, there is a lot of that uh, kind of breakdown to breakthrough in my life. It would be wonderful if I could just read this stuff in a book and avoid these problems, but it seems like that's why um, I'm on the earth. And, you know, I think the reason why I'm here, if you mean it kind of in the biggest, most possible sense, is that I have been, you know, well, let me back up. I'm here for the exact same reason that you are and that every single person listening is. There is something that is meant for you. And I believe that when you're born, your dreams and the things that align with your energy and your purpose and what makes you come alive, whether, you know, I'm talking about a relationship or a project or a profession or a neighborhood or any kind of hobby, those things that make you become more of who you are, they make you feel energized and alive. 
there are, there's something that's divinely meant for you. And so the reason why I'm here is because I am trying to figure out what is meant for me. And as I'm on that journey of um, leaning toward the things that pull me and that I find the courage, you know, as you say, built through courage, as I build the courage through the various ups and downs of life to lean toward the things that I really desire instead of talking myself out of them, um, I'm finding and discovering what's meant for me. And yeah. So that's, I think, why we're all here. Like that you're, you know, everybody talks about purpose, Dave, finding your purpose. I think that you, your purpose is very simple. Your purpose is to share your story because there's only ever going to be one you. There will never be another you in the history of this world. Nobody with the same iris shape, nobody with your DNA, your handprints, your voice, nobody with the experiences that you have. And right now, somewhere on the planet, there is a human being who needs your story. They need to know how you failed and what you learned. They need to know uh, what you have to share. And um, that it's selfish, honestly, not to share what you're going through because somebody needs you. And you know, we're all busy looking for purpose outside of us, but you are the purpose of your life. What's uh, so good, what like one of the things I think that actually ends up connecting us is this like recognition that you have of the times when you've dug your own holes or found yourself you know, almost like tripping into your own way. I, I resonate so much with it. I find myself as someone who's written books and has studied as much as I possibly can inside of personal development, feeling like I have an almost unfair advantage by knowing the answer key. And yet, despite having possession of the answer key, forget the answers to the tests at times. And in a weird way, I think sharing those times when I've made the mistake of not following the instruction I know to be the thing that would actually have me staying out of my own way, it connects me to an audience that of course finds themselves also doing the same thing. It's just a part of our humanity. Yeah, and you know, I learned something really interesting a couple of years ago that took me down a big rabbit hole that's made a big difference. And it's actually kind of where one of the habits in the high five habit, the high five in your heart comes from. So here's an interesting thing. Um, when we're reading about or talking about changing, whether you're sitting in a therapist's office and you're like, all right, that's it. This week, I'm not going to snap at my kids. Or this week, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of thinking these terrible things. I'm going to go in there and have that hard conversation. Or I'm not going to eat the donut. Whatever it is, when you're talking about or thinking about change, you're using the conscious part of your brain. That's actually not the part of the brain that you have to interrupt in order to change behavior. So you have all this good intention. We read all these books, Dave. We talk about all the stuff that we're going to do. We're really smart, like well-meaning people. And then you get out into your life and your kid says something or does something or you get a text or something happens. And like it just happened this morning. Like I, there's somebody that I deeply admire and they had to reschedule the podcast interview and they said, and we're sorry, we're not going to be able to do it this, this fall. I immediately went to... I've done something wrong. They hate me. They saw a post that I put up. They don't think I'm smart enough to be on there. Oh, they're a cool person and I'm not part of that. I immediately went there because when life punches you in the face, you're, you don't ever react consciously. Your nervous system takes over and you go right into the default patterns that keep you stuck. And so the game of change, and I know you talk about this too, is not only the courage to find the self-awareness and face the stuff that you need to face, but it's the courage that you need to build in order to break the old habits and interrupt new ones, to catch yourself in those moments when you start circling the drain mentally or you get so emotionally charged that you're now like a T-Rex snapping at your kids when you had just promised in therapy last week, you were gonna stay calm and meditate. Yeah. That's part of the issue. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I just came out of this weekend. We had this uh, opportunity with uh, 115, 20, 120 people who are in the midst of a weight loss journey that had come together and, you know, like losing half your body weight is a like just unbelievable kind of thing. I mean, like the person leading this, his name's Bruce, is, 
had, had, he went from 400 to 200 pounds. Like it's wild. And most of the people who are there are maybe a hundred pounds into a 200 pound loss goal. That's I mean, it's incredible. wild. And one of the things that we spent more time than anything else talking about was this, this concept of integrity, where the thing that I know for myself, when I feel the best about myself, when I'm by myself, it's when I've kept the promises that I've made to myself. And when I don't, that's when I have guilt or shame or I have bad confidence or start to like have that critic really rear its head inside of my, inside of my head. And, and I think that ends up being the thing here where when you start listening to those voices in a, in a state of dissonance where you're now not in integrity with what you've suggested you wanted to be that promise you made to yourself in therapy or the way that you may have committed to doing something to your partner, that's when you end up feeling those things. Integrity for me has just kind of become everything. And yet I still struggle to maintain a, a, a constant state of integrity, even though I know that's the place I want to be in. Well, the reason why we struggle with integrity is because we have never built a rock solid relationship with ourselves. So look at the podcast situation that just happened to me this morning. Somebody cancels for tomorrow. I really admire this person and I immediately betray myself. Instead of having a, uh, a story in my mind or an explanation, which is, oh, well, that makes sense. They're super busy and maybe something happened in their personal life and they just canceled everybody because the, you know, the person, the publisher that reported this back to me said, it was really weird. It was really like not out. It was out of the ordinary to which I was like, they really hate me because this <laughs> is out of the ordinary. And so I immediately betrayed and bashed myself. Why? The reason why is because none of us know how to improve the relationship we have with ourselves. And if we look in the mirror, Dave, and we see somebody that is not worthy or not lovable or isn't where they're supposed to be, if you literally see somebody that you don't love, that you can't cheer for, you will never, ever, 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 ever be able to be out in the world and provide those things for somebody else or to feel those things from somebody else. It all yeah. starts with you. And so yeah. I think integrity begins with how you treat yourself. And it feels so good to keep the little promises that you make to yourself, whether you're, it's making your bed every morning or it's not snapping at your kids or it's getting your water in every day or it's moving your body every day. And you're so good at supporting people through making those changes, Dave. And it feels good, not because you're doing those things, but because you are keeping a promise to yourself, which we have for our entire lives. We have habits of breaking the promises we make to ourselves because we don't put ourselves first, we put ourselves last. Yeah. And so integrity and keeping those promises is really the bridge between where you're at right now, criticizing, ignoring, trashing yourself, and where you want and deserve to get to, which is being in a relationship with yourself that feels rock solid and supportive and loving, no matter what you're going through. Yeah. You, well, so you talk about the relationship you have with the person in the mirror, which is just kind of everything. Sorry, I'm going to go back to this experience I had yesterday because it, it just is so stuck with me. We ended up setting up a photo shoot for this group of people who have come together so yeah. that they might see themselves the way that we see them as yeah. perfect and beautiful and the like like just the essence of life because there's just so much joy that is resonating out of these humans who are making progress even if they are not yet at their goal and there was something in this photo shoot room where when they were able to see after a little bit of posing and coaching and whatever else like no 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 this is what we see every single day Boom, there was confidence that was ignited. There was a connection to loving self that was ignited. And I know that the high five habit in many ways is about being able to look yourself in the mirror and love the thing that is looking back. God, could we just have a moment for how our lives would be just radically different if we, when we saw ourselves in the mirror, just only thought about like positive things instead of looking for all the negative. Talk a little bit about what it means to look yourself in the mirror, why it is that we need to change the relationship we have with that person in the mirror. 
You got it. So first of all, we're both parents. And one of the interesting things about this concept, and this is the other brand of my personal development, if it sounds stupid on its <laughs> face, and if it feels weird to do it, that's a Mel Robbins tool. Like everything that I figure out, I figure out by mistake. And then when it starts to work, Dave, I'm so embarrassed to share it that I am forced to, for my own ego, go do research so I can explain using science why this dumb, weird thing I'm telling you will change your life, is going to change your life. We have kids. We would do anything as parents to make our kids grow up and believe in themselves and put themselves first and not get into terrible relationships or toxic friends groups and to have boundaries and to stick up for themselves. So we uh, like fill our kids with all these ideas in their minds. I mean, we see it going viral right now. These teachers that are high-fiving kids as they go into classrooms or parents that are doing affirmations with their kids. I am beautiful. I am smart. I am this. We know this is so important, which is why we are desperately trying to do this for our kids. Guess what? Nobody's ever taught you how to do this for yourself. Yeah. No one. You know, if Dave walked in here, I would be able to lift him up. I would be, I would pat him on, just like you did for those people in the mirror. When we stand in front of the mirror, Dave, we don't see a human being that is worthy of celebrating. What we see and what we drag with us into the bathroom are all of our mistakes, all of our regrets, all of the trauma, all of the stuff we've done to other people, all the abuse that we've survived. We also bring all this judgment about where we're not. I don't have that number on the scale yet, but I haven't yeah. lost the weight, Dave, but I don't have the money in the bank, but I haven't started that business, but I'm in the middle of a divorce, but I'm this, but I'm that. And you stand there with your arms crossed and you either criticize yourself or you ignore yourself. That's what everybody's habit is right now. Now, I discovered this by mistake. I mean, you know, everybody's got a pandemic story and this isn't a pandemic book. This is a universal book. I am so passionate about this, Dave. I think this is bigger than the five second rule. I really do. I think the five second rule gets you moving and it helps you push through doubt and fear and anxiety and helps you take the actions to become a different person. I think this goes so much deeper. I think this repairs the relationship you have with yourself. You know, yeah. getting into action will not take away your self-loathing. Learning how to cheer for yourself, learning how to support yourself no matter what, that is the secret to everything. And so, you know, one morning I wake up and it's like the beginning days of the pandemic. And, I, you know, I, I follow you. I, you know, know that we're, there's a lot of blessings in the pandemic. There's a lot of curses in the pandemic. And those early days, but I don't even remember the first two weeks because I was either drinking. I didn't change out of my pajamas. We did nothing but watch Harry Potter as a family. My kids were in a state of distress because college had imploded. I had just been fired from my dream job of hosting a daytime talk show, book contract canceled, speeches canceled. I'm now getting re-triggered because I think Chris and I are in a financial free fall. And I, I, I'm like literally barely functioning. I wake up one morning. I use a five second rule, five, four, three, two, one to get out of bed. I make my bed. And then I drag myself into the bathroom and I'm standing there in my underwear and I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror. And I thought, God, you look like hell. <laughs> and I've got these dark circles under my eyes and my gray hair is coming in. And I, you know, I actually felt sorry mm. for the woman I saw in the mirror. She had the weight of the world on her shoulder. She was worried about her kids. She was worried about her employees. She was worried about the state of the world. She was worried about her parents. She was worried about all the frontline workers. She was worried about her finances. Like you could just tell based on physicality that this was a person who was overwhelmed by life. And of course, once you start criticizing yourself and how you look and the thoughts go negative, Dave, they just keep going negative. Yeah. And so I then were like, why did you get up so late? You haven't even responded to Dave's text. Like the dog still needs to be walked. You need to like, I just start bashing myself. And here's the thing. If you get really honest with yourself, this is your morning routine. Like we talk a lot about how you set your day up is how it ends up. The truth is your morning routine is in place and it sucks. 
and it is not setting you up for success. And you're not even present to the beat down that you begin your day with. Yeah. And so, you know, what's interesting is had you walked into the bathroom in that moment, I would have been able to turn to you and been like, Dave, come on. I know this sucks. This isn't fair, Dave. You, you can do this. Like, I'm going to help you. I would have been able to pick you up. Yeah. But despite everything that you and I know, despite what I do for a living, I couldn't think of a single thing to say to myself. And so as pathetic as it sounds, standing there in my bra, I didn't have a bra on. I didn't have a cup of coffee yet. I got a boob hanging lower than the other one. I literally raised my hand and high five my reflection. And it was interesting because that first one felt so corny. It's so much so that I even kind of laughed at myself. At, but as I pulled my hand away, my shoulders dropped and I felt my chin lift up and I thought, okay, this sucks, but you, you can do this, Mel. You can do this. And I went on with my day. It was the second day though, Dave, you're going you're gonna to find this really interesting. The second day was when something clicked because I woke up and I immediately thought of that high five thing. I five, four, three, two, one, get out of bed. I make my bed. I start walking into the bathroom. And then this is when I noticed something really interesting. You know how when you are about to see a friend, you're going to meet him for, you know, a cup of coffee or something, or, you know, right before we were like logging on, I'm like super excited to see Dave. Yeah. There's this anticipation of seeing somebody you really like. I felt that as I was walking toward the bathroom. Amazing. I was looking forward to seeing myself. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to be 53 this year. I bet for the past 45 years, Dave, there have been moments I've been looking forward to seeing what the outfit looked like or my makeup looked like. I have never, never looked forward to seeing Mel the human. And as I got in there and I looked at myself, I realized that there is a person that I need to build a relationship with. Yeah. And that it's the person I'm going to spend my whole life with. And I don't invest any time into really thinking about supporting and celebrating myself. And so I, I, that second moment, I was like, okay, well, what are we going to do today? How are you going to show up? I started thinking about the game I wanted to play. And then I raised my hand and I high five myself again and sort of sealed that intention. And, you know, here's the interesting thing about it, Dave. Like the thing that I love about it is you don't say anything. The gesture does all the work because for your entire life, you've been high-fiving other people. And so when you just raise your hand and you give that gesture to yourself, all the programming that's already in your brain associated with a high-five, I believe in you, I love you, I see you, I got you, we're in it, come on, let's keep going. It just automatically shuts up your critic and all the default programming that is a habit and it overrides it and reprograms a brand new soundtrack in your mind about how you think about yourself. It's freaking bananas. So, so good. It's really interesting because in real time, as you're saying this, so I have written on my mirror in my bathroom, not motivated, me either, who cares, do it anyway. And so, I, so it's written out and I walk into the bathroom and I say it out loud to myself, not motivated, who cares? Me either. Do it anyway. I but what I realized, like, then the thing is, it's been, and, and I laugh at myself because I, it, it is a, it's a trick, a hack to get me laughing about not being motivated as I'm putting on my stuff for the gym. Because I wish that I was just someone who like jumped out of bed and was like, yes, I'm gonna go work out. This is so great. And I am not that person. And this, this tool to like, just make me laugh at myself and say, go do it anyway has been effective. But What's interesting is I can see as you're saying what you're saying, that actually the thing that I've written isn't actually a vehicle to make me feel stronger as much as it is something to just kind of whip me into continuing to move forward. It doesn't actually give me a positive thought about myself. It reaffirms that I'm someone who isn't motivated, which is wow. like really, in it's really interesting to think about in real time because uh, I've never until I met you, high fived myself in the mirror. But there is, but there is something about it, right? But there, but there's something, but there's something in that because of what, as you're saying, like there's just so much already implicitly. Well, what is it? What is a high five? If you give one of your kids, or you give somebody on a sports team, or you give somebody in your life a high five, what are you saying to them, Dave? 
That's exactly what it is. It's you're saying, hey, I see you. Congratulations. You're awesome. Go get it. We're like celebrating. But like there's there's so much just already in that single move that almost like a smell might trigger a memory that high five is going to trigger the same thing. Okay, so I spoke to our friend, Dr. Daniel Amen. He geeked out about this. So here's what he explained to me. What do you, I'm going to explain the science because your nervous system and your brain do the heavy lifting for you with this gesture. So when you cross a finish line, what do you immediately do? You raise your hands in the air, right? To celebrate. Yeah. Woo! When you go to wave to somebody, what do you do? You raise your hands in the air. What do you do when you hug somebody? You raise your hands in the air. What do you do when you high five somebody? You raise your hands in the air. Guess what? Your nervous system is wired for that action to feel celebratory. And so one of the things that he said is that if you repeat this action over time, your nervous system will start to pay attention and will give you a jolt of energy in the morning because you're doing it. The second thing that happens is your brain gives you a drip of dopamine. So it boosts your mood. And so the way to reprogram your story about yourself is, yeah, I'd trace your hand so you see the hand. And I'd also say, you know, something along the lines of, you know, put it in your Dave funny voice but something along the lines of surprising, isn't it? You're actually excited to exercise. Like it's literally like, like sort of, you know, go get them, Dave, like yep. that kind of thing. Because what happens is, I'm glad you caught that because I don't ever want you to lose your really smart and funny as hell, kind of self-deprecating, sarcastic sense of humor. But there's a line then that it crosses where it becomes the monologue. Perpetuating, and- yeah. Yeah. That it perpetuates something feeling. And this is the thing that has become profound to me practicing the high five habit. So I've been at it now for a year. And um, one of the things that's really interesting about it is I actually don't need to high five myself anymore to feel it because I've actually reprogrammed my whole brain. I don't even see a physical person. I see a human being. I don't ever criticize my reflection, which is I, amazing. Weird. Amazing. Because I've been doing this for so long that I know what it's like to now switch the gears. Just like half the time, I don't need to count backwards five, four, three, two, one, because I've effectively built those neural pathways through repetition. It's a subconscious habit. So my new default is you don't criticize that person. Just like nobody is going to criticize my kid and live. I feel that way about myself. Yeah. Like I'm not allowed to do that to myself through the repetition of this, Dave. And it's because of the science involved in this that makes me so excited for people to understand that it's not, yes, you can do the actions. Yes, you can change your life by pushing yourself through fear and anxiety. Sure can, and I have. But you will experience a level of joy and contentment and acceptance in your life if you can change how you see yourself. It's everything. I I mean, like I am so proud of who I've become and I still once a week, once a week, have a conversation with Heidi about how I wish that I love myself as much as she reports Mm. to love me. Okay, so hold on. Can I just unpack this for a minute? Let's go. Yeah, come on, therapist. This is why this is so important. This is why this is so important. Your relationship with yourself is the foundation of every relationship you have. So if you don't fully love and accept yourself, you will never believe that Heidi loves you as much as she does because you don't. Yeah. Same thing with our kids. And this is also why it's so important for us to do this because we all so desperately want to break the generational stuff that our parents passed on to us. We don't want to screw up our kids the way we feel like we've been screwed up or are screwed up by life or whatever your like story about it is. That the only way to effectively have your kids do something different is to show them something different. Yeah. It's so interesting because I'm in real time trying my best to unlearn programming that said your lovability is connected to your achievement. Mm. And I'm in a season where I'm being really deliberate about what I am committing myself to because I only want to do things that are 100% connected to purpose, that are 100% connected to impact, that are 100% connected to passion, which means I'm saying no to a lot more things. And the interesting effect that saying no to things is having 
is it is compromising my ability to feel like I am as deserving of love because I am not producing as much as I was previously. And that is bonkers. And thankfully, I have a therapist named David who sits with me for an hour each week and hears me talk about this. And now you listening to this as well. But I, I understand, man, this came from my childhood, not intentionally, but it's yeah. just who I am and how I was raised that if I could check enough boxes then, but not before, I would be enough and worthy. And in a, in a season where I'm, you know, like still very, very, I feel so good about the book that I've written and the work that I'm doing. Good, it's I'm not doing as much as I did before. And it's making it harder for me as an achiever to connect to or give myself credit. And, and I, it's like this, it comes back to being able to look myself in the mirror and be proud of this person who is doing great. Thank you very much. And great is being now judged on a different set of criteria than maybe I had judged myself before. And that's okay. Well, well, I'm, just, know, I'm Dave, still learning it. I can relate to this. And I think just about everybody can. Because what happens is you're born loving and accepting yourself for exactly who you are. You know, if you watch a baby crawl up to a mirror, they don't take a step back and go, boy, those rolls on my thighs. Are <laughs> yep. They literally put their hands up on a mirror and start licking it. Like we are hardwired to love ourselves. When you start school, um, and it can happen sooner if you grew up in a chaotic or abusive or traumatic household. But when you get to school, that's when the sorting hat starts. And you start to see the world in places that you belong and places that you don't. And everything starts to get measured. And so you start to measure everything outside of you. And it is human nature to give somebody praise when they do a good job. And so we start to marry achieving something with being loved. Yeah. I have the exact same thing. And so the real gift of your adult life is to learn how to be with yourself as you are where you are and know that you are worthy of and need and deserve love and support right now. And that those things outside of you do not make you worthy. The fact that you are breathing, that you have survived everything that you've survived, that you're still showing up every day wanting to do just a little bit better, that that is worthy of celebration and of the high five and of love. And the irony too, with all the research is when you celebrate and, and, and support yourself for where you are, you're more motivated to do the things that you need to do in terms of the changes to yeah. have all the things that you desire. Yeah. Like it's a double whammy. I wanna find, while you, while you respond, I wanna find a text to read to you from our 21 year old daughter because well, I'll just throw this out because when we were in uh, Napa with our crew, Brendan and I sat down and we were talking about something that he'd shared at the very beginning of my uh, divorce. As I was like, man, I'm lost. I don't know who I am if I'm not the husband to this person. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked about a whole bunch of things. But one of the things that he said that stuck with me, and we talked about it again when we were together two weeks ago, is this idea of what freedom ends up being. And freedom, as we defined it, was the ability to fully be yourself, free from social comparison and self-doubt. Free from social comparison and self-doubt. That is freedom. And I'm getting closer to being free from social comparison. It's the self-doubt that I still, every single day, have to work through because... I, man, I believe I'm here for such audaciously big things. And there's still those voices that are like, are you sure that you're qualified to handle the responsibility of this big thing that you've been put here for? And, you know, like that, my, if you say like, well, what are you working toward right now? I'm working toward freedom. I want to be free from my self-doubt. I want to be free from the worry of what other people might say about me living into my calling. If I could get to that place, that's where I feel like peace comes from, where I would find a true fulfillment in enjoying the freedom of not having to deal with or worry about other people or myself. You're judging it's all, me. it's all locked up in this idea that you're not lovable unless you're achieving something outside of you. That's, that's where the heart of this is. Yeah. I, I swear to God. Yeah. Because yeah. it's really not about comparing. You're already judging that you're not doing enough. And so if you can, you're right, reach that. I, I, and I know this because this is the, the world I live in. I mean, we were joking because 
when we first met Dave, my husband and I were there and I, I cracked this joke, which is true. When, when, you know, your business with, with Rachel was just skyrocketing and you guys started doing all these events, I was so jealous because people have been saying to me forever that I should do events. I should do events. And I've always wanted to do events. I just didn't have the team around me. And so I would literally turn to my husband and be like, why can't you be like Dave Hollis? Why can't you help me with this? And so when Chris met Dave for the first time, <laughs> I was like, I don't know if Chris is going to hug you, Dave, or strangle you because he has told me, you know, that I need a strategist, you know, like Dave's such a brilliant business guy and you are a brilliant business guy, but we all, all, all do this to ourselves. And I was doing this at a point in time when I had three number one audiobooks, three super healthy, th health, healthy, thriving kids. I had a daytime syndicated talk show launching, which was my dream by the way, which is why I wasn't doing events. But even so, it wasn't because of the world. It was because my opinion is. By the way, can we also, though, acknowledge, and I said this to Chris, that like this is yet another example that from the outside, the optics of everything working well or perfectly were something right. that was being put on us in a way that clearly we know how the story ended up working out it wasn't all as good as it may have seemed. And so the thing that you or he or both of you were, you know, using as a model wasn't even a model to be modeled after anyway. You know, it's just, it's, it's such true. a wild it's thing. True. We have no idea what anybody's going through. So I want to share two things with you. One thing that's been super helpful for me to, to kind of break that sort of, if I do X, then I will be lovable and to flip it into, oh, I'm lovable, which means I can do X or not if I want to. So that's one thing. But the second thing is I've got this little thing that I've been saying a lot, which has been super helpful, which is, well, what if it all works out how it's supposed to? Yeah. Like instead of like, I need you to do that thing. Well, what if, what if this is the chapter of my life where I'm just going to be happy and it all works out? What if this is the hardest decision I've ever made? And um, it's going to give me the thing that I learn and it all works out. What if I just trust and I keep going forward that being a little bit quieter and a little less busy is what has it all work out. And that sort of coming back home to having faith in the direction that I'm moving has been a game changer. I wanna share with you, Dave, um, something from our 21 year old daughter who is uh, a junior at the University of Southern California. She is in the thick of the comparison game. Let's think about everybody being 21, being at a university, in Southern California in particular, you know, where everybody and, and, and then some is better than the next. And so she goes, I've been high-fiving myself in the mirror. And I say, well, how's the high-five working? And she said, I don't know what to say. Because sometimes I look in the mirror and I think you're not as pretty as the rest of the girls. And I said, then she goes, I think I need to start practicing the law of attachment. I think she meant the law of attraction. And I said, well, what do you mean you don't know what to say? You don't have to say anything because the high five gesture communicates it. And then she says this, but what if I didn't accomplish anything? Like I didn't work out or I didn't go to the studio and record a song. Should I still high five myself after my shower if I didn't accomplish anything? And I said, I mean, how sad is this? I'm, it's making me cry, honestly. You keep showing up every day trying to do a little better. That alone makes you worthy of support and celebration. Can we have the secret to life and happiness and motivation backwards? You think you need to accomplish something to be worthy of a high five. And then she writes, you mean the fact that I exist deserves a high five? Yes. When you high five yourself for just standing there in front of the mirror, you are demonstrating that you see you and all your potential. You support and believe in you. And that no matter what, today you've got your own back, even if you didn't exercise and even if you didn't write a song. What do you think about what I just wrote? She says, I love it. It makes me feel great. And then I said, can you explain why? Because you explaining it will help me explain it to everyone else. She says, well, what it shows you is that you don't actually know how much you're always doing. And I think that once you start high-fiving yourself every single morning, it almost allows you to be more present 
to everything you are doing. And it helps you recognize all those small victories. And when you compile those small victories, you can recognize all of your big accomplishments, big and small, and eventually come to believe that not only are you worth it, but you can do anything. Wow. Wow. I, it makes me like I started getting uh, tears in my eyes because this is one of those things that I think is just universal. I think every person listening at one point or currently struggles with believing that they are worthy of a high five. What is happening? Like that they're worthy of a high five unless yeah. they've, you know, done something extraordinary. And I, I'm among them, you know? It's yeah. Hard. And I know how committed you are with your daughter in particular in giving her the tools to believe in herself in a world and all of your kids, Dave, like it yeah. comes through in everything that you do as a father. And, you know, it really, it's hard because, you know, she can write something heartbreaking, like I'm not the prettiest one, or, but what if I didn't go to the gym or I didn't write that song because she's in music school and it breaks your heart. Yeah. But I can't have this breakthrough for her. She has to learn how to treat herself in a way that is kind and is compassionate and so do you that's this is everything though this is like if you're listening go ahead and rewind 10 seconds because this ends up being everything someone else cannot tell you that you are loved that you are lovable that you're worthy or enough it's a thing that you have to it's a it's an, an exercise in self-discovery and that you have to yourself figure it out and it is and it's not that that makes it easy but it's only when you do that you'll see it and i i truly believe that I do too. And th that's why I'm like, I'm blown away by this simple thing because it's got so much science behind it. And, you know, it's kind of one of those gaps in life where you know that this is true. You know, you need to be kind. You know, you need to love yourself. You know, you need to put yourself first. You know, you need boundaries. You know, you need to like yourself. And then it won't matter if other people like you, but none of us know how. And so using science, this simple gesture not only activates all this stuff, Dave, but we're also opening up a whole field of study called behavioral activation therapy, which is actually the body of research that supports all of the coaching that you provide people. Yeah. You are teaching people to act like the person you wanna become. And the reason why this is as, if not more effective than co cognitive behavioral therapy, or at least it can be, is because when your brain sees you taking those actions, your brain starts to change in real time and starts to relate to you like the kind of person who is healthy or the yeah. kind of person who has boundaries or the kind of person who loves themselves. Yeah. So I think- By the way, just taking it back again, sorry, I'm going back to yesterday. We finished our three-day experience with this group of people by finishing a 5K, a thing that for 90% of them was an impossibility in their life. And yet- I ran, I mean, I ran that last stretch 50 times with someone who for the first time in their entire life was crossing a finish line of a race, a run, 3.1 miles, a thing they never thought that they would do. But now that they were able to see that they were capable of doing it, it reframes what they think that they're capable of. And I, like for anyone who wants to know, like, how do you grow? Like the, the thing I would say first is like, go do something that you don't think you can do to change the way you believe yourself to be capable of doing it. It's a, it's a thing that will happen immediately. And I subscribe so much to this as a part of the science. Well, and I think one of the reasons why you also got really emotional when you started, like what happened for you when you said, you know, like, it's just, it, it makes you weep when you think how every human being out there thinks they're not worthy of it. Well, I can connect with want, I want so desperately to feel the thing I know I ought to which is pride for the man that I am and the way that I'm attempting to impact others and father these kids and co-parent well. And I am my harshest critic. And that harshness doesn't actually serve me being a better dad or being a better coach or being a better author or any of those things. It actually compromises it. And so those tears or that feeling is a sadness that this flaw in humanity generally, not flaw in me, but just in humanity generally, is something that might be a governor in some ways from me being able to connect to all the good that already exists so that I can actually unleash that good 
in a more powerful way. And so it's, I think it's more like I'm grieving just the humanity that is, and I want so badly to kick it out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and I think for men in particular, you know, I know Chris, my husband has struggled with this profoundly um, and has been working on it. When his restaurant business failed, he was unable to separate the failure of that business from the indictment that he then gave himself. I am yeah. a failure. Sure. And, and women, we get the pressure more about looks, about being nice, about um, being a good caretaker. That's sort of how society defines whether or not you're succeeding as a woman or you're, a, you're you know, worthy of love as a woman for you guys, at least in a traditional gender you know, kind of manner, it's about providing. And so yep. don't forget that you have this added layer when it comes to achievement that society has put on, that if you're not busy, if you're not providing, if the busyness and the achievements aren't stacking up, then you are not doing what you're supposed to do. So it adds an even you know, more pressure as you try to crack this open. And when you, you know, when I think about built through courage, like I think what you're getting present to is what I was saying. The, well, you said freedom, which is an amazing word, free from the judgment, free from the constraint, that there is a joy, there's a contentment and there is the freedom to make mistakes, to swing for the fences, to do life on your terms, and to really bring all the validation, support, and love that you're looking for right back here with you first. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be respectful of time. I mean, honestly, Mel, I'd talk to you for like five days. If this podcast <laughs> would take it, we'd go Rogan on them and just talk forever. But um, you've got a day full of podcasts and I want to be respectful of time. So let's talk about the five, sorry, the high five habit. I know the book is eminently coming out. Whenever this is uh, going to be broadcast, it will be out or just out in a second. And so I want to talk about what people can expect when they buy the book. And then I want you to talk about the high five challenge because that's going to be a big part of this launch. And I want to encourage everyone listening to yes. take advantage of it. Yes. So the high five habit, whether you buy the book or you listen to the audio book that I uh, recorded, um, you're going to, I think it's, well, I mean, you, you, you read it. I, I, um, I, it's, it's, I am more proud of this than anything I've put out there. And the reason why I say that even knowing that more than 111 people have stopped themselves from committing suicide by using the five second rule, even knowing that pediatricians and veterans organizations are using the five second rule to help people with PTSD and anxiety, even knowing all the success stories, I personally am already seeing such a profound shift in people and in myself and my own life experience now that I have simple tools to yeah. learn how to love myself. Yeah. Game changer. Game changer. Um, it's it is the most incredible book. Honestly, it is the most incredible book. It is simple and most incredible. Oh. It's, it's a thing that I think every single person who is listening should read. And it is one of the few things that I would say, if you actually read it and follow what it suggests, it'll change your life. It will. Thank you. I, 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 and, and it's, and, and like, so there, so the high five in the mirror is just the Trojan horse. And there's a bunch of stories. Like I was shocked because when I sat down with like Ed Millette and uh, Tom Bilyeu and, you know, some of these like guys, you know, Lewis Howes, I was expecting them to kind of be like, Tom goes, that painting story, Mel, I thought it was gonna like I, I'm crying and like yeah. and Ed Millette cry is crying during our interview about because I think we're all so busy trying and we're not being and we're so busy trying to prove instead of accepting ourselves and the truth is that these books don't change the stuff around you it changes you yeah and that empowers you to change the things around you and so there's a level of depth in this and entertainment and you know, funny stories in it that'll be relatable. And so I think you're going to just get a tremendous amount of it. You're really going to enjoy it, but I want you to put it to use. So Dave and I are doing something called the high five challenge. And we've got a ton of like inspiring friends that are doing it. And I want you to join it. It's free. 
It's five days where you get access to growth day, which I'm sure you know, both Dave and I are coaches on. You don't have to put a credit card. You don't have to do, sh- you don't have to do anything. You give us your first name and your email address. Dave will have the link in the bio. I don't care if you listen to this 10 years after the book is published. This challenge will be live and available to you for free. And it's five days where you get access to growth day. You get five days of coaching. You get tools like journaling all backed by science. And you get a huge global community of people that will be high-fiving you back and cheering you on. And you will come out of this five-day simple challenge around breaking the the habit of self-doubt and fear that are holding you back and helping you step-by-step take control of your life to get the freedom that Dave's talking about, to get the practice in loving yourself and cheering for yourself and feeling a sense of momentum. You're going to come out of this thing like feeling like a million bucks and like you've been launched out of a rocket. So just click the link in the bio. I wanted to do that because I think it's easy to read a book. It's easy to high five yourself in the mirror for three or four days and go, well, this is weird. I'm dumb. I'm not, I'm just going to put this book away on the shelf and not actually stick with it. Dave used the word integrity and you build integrity every morning at a time. And you can do it in very simple ways. You can do it by getting out of bed. That's a promise you kept. You can do it by making your bed. That's a promise you can keep. You can do it by something I called high-fiving your heart. That's a promise you can keep. You can high-five your mirror. That's a promise you can keep. All these simple things start to rebuild that integrity that you need with yourself as you send yourself to face yet another day. So good. I'm excited. The uh, link to the challenge is in the show notes, please. It's a free five-day challenge. There is a massive global community that's going to join us in this thing. And I promise you, as much as you may roll your eyes at high-fiving yourself in the mirror, it's a thing that five days in will fundamentally change the way that you look at yourself and love yourself in the mirror. Final question, Mel Robbins. We ask the same question every single time of every guest. If there was a single piece of advice that you could give, an actionable thing, a question, an idea, what's the one thing that you would leave listeners with today? Especially if you're resisting this. You must. You need. And I'm begging you, high five yourself five days in a row because you need it. That resistance is what's stopping you from having the happiness, the freedom, the fulfillment, the everything that you so deserve. And you can break through it one high five at a time. Mel Robbins, you are one of my favorite human beings on this entire stinking planet. I love you. I wish you were my neighbor. I wish we were neighbors. I think we get in a lot of trouble. The neighborhood watch would be on us every single day. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this episode and how could you have not, please take a picture of this episode in the device that you are listening to. Tag myself, tag Mel, tag every person you believe needs to hear something good that came out of this. Share it with every human being you've ever met in your entire life. And between now and next week, high five yourself in the mirror. Change the way that you look at yourself when you see yourself. We'll see you next week on another episode of the Rise Together podcast. Thank you, Mel. I love you, Dave.